Hi, this is Albert van Dijk, uh, and in this video um, I'd like to um, try and show how remote sensing actually works. Um, so we can start with our own eyes, um, and we can have a, a good sense already of how passive remote sensing works, because the way it works in the remote sensing instruments and in the human eye is actually quite similar. Uh, and by the way, we call it passive remote sensing because we're not actually emitting radiation that we then measure again. Uh, we're using the radiation that is emitted from the sun, typically, um, and then measure um, uh, that with our instrument. So here's a picture of the human eye, a diagram, uh, and it shows you some of the components that you'll also find in, uh, in uh, remote sensing instruments. So we've got a protective layer, the cornea uh, here in particular, uh, and then inside the eye, the light first passes through the pupil, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, opening that determines uh, how much light comes in. Then it passes through a lens uh, that, uh, that uh, focuses the light uh, on the, uh, uh, the back of the eyeball. Uh, and then here we have the retina uh, fed by the blood vessels uh, and uh, the optic nerve, uh, which takes uh, the, uh, the signal that is received to the brain. Uh, and if we look at the retina in a bit detail, we see that there's different cones and rods, different sensors essentially, uh, with the cones measuring a specific uh, wavelengths, the red, blue, and green wavelengths particularly, uh, and the rods uh, measuring uh, uh, right across those to get a sharper uh, general view. And actually, that's quite, there's quite a lot of similarities between that and how uh, a remote sensing system works. Uh, so if you look at a digital camera, which is arguably one of the simpler remote sensing uh, systems or instruments, um, you see that same lens, uh, you see the uh, wavelength filters that the light is passed through before the actual uh, light intensity is read by a, by a, a sensor array uh, that you see here in yellow. Uh, and then the little voltages from each of these uh, sensors are passed on uh, to uh, the uh, instrument equivalent of the brain. So um, converted first from analog to digital numbers uh, and uh, then stored on a card in this case. So there's really quite a lot of uh, similarities there. Um, now active remote sensing, as I was saying, is a bit different because there we actually emit radiation uh, and then we measure how much of it comes back. So radar is a typical example of that. Uh, radar stands for radio detecting and ranging because it uses radio frequency um, uh, radiation to, uh, to measure something, uh, uh, to, to, to get some knowledge about the environment. And that can be uh, finding planes, as in this example. Uh, it can also be finding rain or, uh, or mapping the surface. Um, similarly, LIDAR uh, is uh, a similar system, um, but then using the visible or the near-infrared radiation uh, and LIDAR stands for light detection and raging. Uh, and in some ways it's comparable but quite different also as opposed to sonar which is sound navigation and ranging which is often used uh, underwater. Um, of course in that case we're not using radiation, we're actually using sound waves. Uh, and so here's a, a, an example of, uh, of a rainfall radar as you might find that uh, the nearest here is Captain's Flat for instance. Uh, the uh, radius, radar signal is emitted uh, and the various rain drops bounce back some of that radiation, and that's what the station measures. Um, two quite fundamentally different uh, ways of measuring uh, a radiation, uh, such as an optical instrument uh, particularly, is through whisk broom scanners or push broom scanners. Uh, and that, 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 different can, that difference can be important once you start looking at imagery, because it will explain some of the issues that you might find. So in a, a whisk broom scanner, um, uh, you will have a little mirror that um, every uh, very rapidly moves backwards and forwards like like a whisk broom, like the, like what's shown here, uh, and basically points the sensor at a particular part of the surface. And so you gradually build up a line, and as the instrument moves forward, uh, then also you start automatically um, sort of uh, building a picture, building an image. Uh, and the old lens set. Um, sent instruments used to have such a, um, a whisk broom scanner. Now, arguably, most modern systems these days have uh, push broom scanners where you've got essentially an array of, of sensors uh, that immediately measures the whole width of the swath. So we call this, uh, the, this, this uh, the area that we look at, we call that scan swath. 
uh, and we've got an array of sensors that instantly uh, measures that whole line. Uh, so it's quite a different way of, of measuring. So the advantage of a, of a whisper room scanner is that you only need one sensor and can be quite sensitive uh, and therefore you can uh, get quite a sharp sort of um, a, a sensitive measurement of, for each pixel individually. Um, the uh, uh, a disadvantage, I suppose, of a push room scanner is that you need a whole array of sensors and therefore you have the costs go up uh, and the sensitivity typically goes down. But having said that, um, the um, most missions these days use so-called push broom scanners or a long track scanners. Um, now, when you start looking at active uh, instruments, it's a whole different story because, uh, for instance, radar uh, does not look straight down; it has to look at an angle. So the emitted radiation uh, that returns to the antenna is actually uh, coming at an angle, and, and that uh, creates some very interesting challenges in interpreting those data. So basically. Uh, it, it is able to look on either side of the uh, satellite on the ground, but not right underneath. Now, very basic geometry, I suppose. Uh, when we look at the satellite, uh, there's a few uh, terms that are important. Nadir may, basically means looking straight down to the surface, uh, to, towards the center of the Earth, if you like, uh, whereas zenith is, um, is uh, going straight up from the surface, uh, away from the center of the Earth. Um, the solar zenith angle is the angle between uh, 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 this direct uh, uh, nadir line uh, and the sun, um, the direction of the sun. And of course, that's going to be determining how, how your uh, uh, lens surface is illuminated and what sort of shade effects you might get. Um, elevation angle is a complement of uh, that solar zenith angle, which is the, 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 the uh, angle between the horizon and the solar inclination. And to give you sort of some uh, uh, examples of how that plays out in practice, of course, you see here uh, an example of uh, the Great Pyramid in Giza. And of course, you're always going to have, um, <clears throat> unless the sun is right behind the instrument, which can sometimes occur, but most of the time you'll have some sort of shadow. And of course, you, that's what you're seeing here. That can be um, quite a, a pain in using imagery because interpreting shadows um, um, uh, uh, needs to take into account the fact that the illumination differs. So this area here gets more radiation than horizontal plane and obviously this uh, part here gets much less. So here is another effect um, that you get that has to do uh, with uh, with uh, illumination and, uh, and, uh, and perspective. And I'm, um, I'm going to challenge you to work out whether there's anything wrong with this image uh, and if so what might, what might be uh, the reason for that. All right, so we looked at the instrument. Now, there's a bit more that comes to uh, to um, uh, uh, deploying a satellite. Uh, and uh, and uh, here's a, a nice example of a, a thing called ArduSet. Now, this is actually a uh, satellite you can build yourself. It's intended for school classes and the like. Uh, and for uh, $3,000 or thereabouts, you can get this uh, uh, at home. You can build your own satellite. Uh, and uh, this company will uh, chuck it out of the uh, International Space Station for you and it will remain in orbit for a while there and you can do your own experiments. So it's pretty cool stuff, but you need a little bit of money. Um, if we look at one of these Ardu sets, you see here um, uh, what engineers tend to start with is the frame, I suppose, uh, and the solar panels, you need an energy source. Uh, you see here the antennas, which you need to communicate with the satellite and of course to, uh, to uh, receive data. Uh, the electrical power supply that stores the solar energy the flight control computer that basically keeps track of, uh, of the orbit uh, of the satellite, the uh, transceiver which uh, generates the radio signal uh, to communicate the uh, actual instrument here, a spectrometer in this case, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the payload which is uh, the, the bit that you can choose in this case which, which uh, maybe gives you, gives you some sort of uh, particular specifications in terms of what the spectrometer measures, what wavelengths and so forth. Um, now, a real satellite mission, if you like, uh, an operational one, uh, looks slightly uh, 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 bigger for starters, uh, but has the basic same element. So you've got your, your satellite with the instrument, the communication, the solar panel. Uh, the data gets downlinked, as it's called, uh, to uh, the uh, satellite receiver station. Uh, and this is an example for a Japanese uh, mission, uh, the Himawari 8, uh, that also covers Australia. 
uh, a geostationary satellite, as we'll see later on. Um, so all the data gets received at this ground station, uh, and then it's uh, uh, accessible for an internet service uh, to uh, people that are, uh, you know, whoever's connected uh, via the internet. But also it's being made available for a more uh, uh, quicker and broader bandwidth communication, I suppose, uh, via a communication satellite to those people uh, who have got a, a communication receiver. And so I guess uh, this sort of circumvents the, uh, the need of using cabling uh, uh, and, and the internet. Um, so this whole part uh, often gets called the ground segment of a, a satellite mission.